This is material that normally is not covered in the course. Be, well, it's covered in the course relatively quickly. Um, but it's important to understand, and it may be a useful reference lecture for you to, to look at as we sort of advance through the rest of the core, or rest of MIE 100. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define specifically what a particle and a rigid body are, uh, look at information on vectors, uh, define the basic definitions and dimensions that we use in the course, and sort of highlight the importance of unit consistency. These will be highlighted and they'll be sort of emphasized on a regular basis as you go through the course, but today I'm just going through these to, to tell you what they are. So the first thing I want to do is define particles versus rigid bodies. And rigid bodies, or sorry, particles are something we already know. And typically when I draw it on a board, I'll draw a box or a circle and I'll put a mass in the center of it. But in reality, a mass is, or a particle is just a mass. There's no dimension to this. And all of it is concentrated at a point. And so the reality is that it's a non, it's, it's zero size with some value of mass, 10 kilograms, 20 kilograms, whatever it is. And it's all concentrated at that point. Inertia only comes from the mass. It's zero volume. And, it, and rotation is meaningless in this case because you can't have something without a dimension rotating because there's nothing to rotate about. This is how we model the first half of the course. And so we look at everything, rocket ships, cars, motorcycles, people, boats, as particles. And we treat it that way as a first step in understanding what's happening. So this is chapters 12 to 15. But after that, we go into, we use this a little bit in a lot, actually, in chapter 22 when we talk about vibrations. The next one is rigid body. So it's a mass. It's just the same thing. So I can have the same mass. And the only difference is that it's distributed over a region of space. But any two points on that body will never change to, uh, dimension or distance. So what that does is it allows for uh, rotation. There's no deformation of the body. It doesn't stretch. It doesn't compress. It always stays the same shape and, and, and uh, everything sort of stays the same. This is, again, uh, for the second half of the course, chapters 16 to 19 and bits of 22. So here's, say, a typical uh, rigid body we look at in the course, say a rectangular plate, some mass with a width of W and a height of H. We then go to vectors and scalars. And the only difference is that uh, scalars are magnitude only speed, length, mass, uh, density, temperature, pressure. We'll go through all of those when we go uh, into, not all of them, not pressure and temperature. We'll talk about density though. Um, vectors are direction and magnitude, displacement, direction, velocity, acceleration, momentum, and force. And those we cover in this course, and it's the one of the fundamental ideas of mechanical engineering. Um, a vector has a tail and it has a head, and the head is always identified uh, by the end of the arrow. And you can see here two different vectors, same magnitude, but different directions. So these would be different, but as scalar lengths, they would be exactly the same. Um, and in order to solve problems in dynamics, uh, you often have to use vectors to do in terms of components. And uh, so for example, here I have AX, AY, and I have a vector A. Vector A is the line right there that defines that distance. Um, and if I want to see what's happening here, I would say, well, A is actually the sum of AX and AY. And I do that as a vector sum where I have uh, X, which I'm going to define in terms of unit vectors. We'll go into more detail later and y in terms of uh, unit vector j. So ax equals uh, ax in the i direction plus ay in the j direction is equal to the vector a. If, um, if I do that, that allows me to describe something in terms of scalar components, ax, ay, and in terms of unit or direction vectors, i and j. 
In terms of the, the magnitude of A, magnitude of A is the square sum of AX squared plus AY squared. Direction of A is going to be theta in this figure right here, so theta. And it's inverse tan of AX over AY. Excuse me, AY over AX. So one of the things you have to get used to is to describe what's happening with a vector in terms of simple mathematical operations. So if I know that A is AX, AY, AX in the I direction, AY in the J direction, B is BX in the I direction, BY in the J direction, I can add A and B together by adding up the I components and the J components separately. And say, for example, I have a vector and I've defined it as AX, I, A, Y, J, but now I'm going to give it numbers, 3 plus 4, a 3 in the I direction, 4 in the J direction, and B, X, B, Y are minus 5 and 8 in the I and J directions, respectively. So what's the magnitude of the vector? So I can start out by taking or plotting A, and that's going to be 6 along the x direction, and J, or 3 in the y direction. And then on B, I could say it's minus 7i plus 4j. So I go back 7 and up 4. And if I do that, I add up the terms, and I end up with 6 minus 7i, 3 plus 4j and I'll end up with a new vector that if I add, take both of these terms and add them head to tail is this one right here, which is going to be minus 1 in the i direction plus 7 in the j direction, which kind of makes sense and that's something that I kind of uh, intuitively see. And then I can do the magnitude and I'll get square root of 50 minus 1 squared for the x component, 7 squared for the j component total square 50. If I take those same vectors and I multiply them by something, say uh, a factor 5, and I say a x a y is 6 plus 3, 6i plus 3j, I'll end up with 5 times 6, which is 30, and 3 times 5, which is 15. So that's a, that's a straightforward multiplication. Another important property is the dot product, and the dot product is A dotted with B, and it's just going to be magnitude of A, the magnitude of B, times cos theta, the angle between the two vectors. These are all scalar terms. The A and B are vector terms. So one of the advantages of this is that it converts a vector with directions into a scalar magnitude. So if I have something like that, here's my A, here's my B, and there's my theta. And cos theta is going to tell me where the final direction is. So if I do A dotted with B, I'm doing all of these terms of its three-dimensional, magnitude of one vector, scalar component second vector, in the direction of the first. And so then I end up with A dotted with B, which is AX, BX, B, A, Y, B, Y, A, Z, B, Z. And one thing to realize is that I dotted with J, I dotted with K is equal to zero. Um, and it's a quantity that's really important when we start to deal with work. So work is one of those quantities uh, in chapter 14 and 18 within the book that you start to look at more carefully. This is a very well done photograph of my thumb showing you a vector product, which is the cross product. So if I wanted to know A cross with B, so from A to B, I have to use my right hand and I curl my fingers in the direction of the multiplication, so from A to B. And if I do that, I get a resultant vector, which is C, which is A cross with B. So this is a two-dimensional plane, <coughs> and this is going to exist normal to the plane. So C is normal to that, uh, to this. So it kind of looks like that. Um, <clears throat> okay. So if I take the two terms, A and B, and I break it up into its uh, X, I, J, and K components, A, X, A, Y, A, X, I, A, Y, J, A, Z, K, B, B, X, I, B, Y, J, B, Z, K, I have A cross with B, and I have X, Y, and Z, A, X, A, Y, A, Z, B, X, B, Y, B, Z. Uh, and 
all of this is just kind of important mainly for rigid body work. We do use it on other things, but uh, it's in terms of, and it's not rigid body work, it's rigid body kinetics, kinematics, and work energy and momentum. And this is a relationship you're going to use a lot. There's also a kind of clever approach I found in a, in a journal called The Physics Teacher. It's from Diego Lozano, the lipstick rule for the cross product. Uh, lipstick applicators placed in the uh, plane containing the vectors, so from A to B, you rotate in the direction of the vectors and your positive uh, is going to show you the direction of the resulting vector. So the tip of the lipstick moves in that direction. Uh, engineers generally like counter, uh, counterclockwise as a positive direction. You use the determinants to calculate all the terms. So first you take a, uh, a cross with B and you strike out the first column in the first row. And all you have left are uh, A, Y, A, Z, B, Y, B, Z. And so the X component of your determinant is going to be uh, a, Y, B, Z minus A, Z, B, Y. Uh, on the next one, you strike out the second column in first row, and there again, you have A, X, A, Z, B, X, B, Z. And the only difference is that because it's the second term, you get this negative right here, so right there. And you gotta be worried about that. So minus A, X, B, Z minus A, Z, B, X. And then finally, you cross out the last row and you get the relationship AXBY minus AYBX. And your vector product or your cross product, C A cross with B is AYBZ minus AZBY in the I direction, minus AXBZ minus AZBX J direction, AXBY minus AYBX in the K direction. So altogether, you then have a relationship that you can use and you will use a lot in the second half of the course particularly. Now, if you have a, a quantity like uh, 6i plus 3j, just putting some numbers down, I can put all of these together and I get uh, and seven, minus 7i plus 4j, I get minus, or 6, 3, 0, because k is 0 in this case, minus 7, 4, 0 and I will get all of these terms. Now, the, the interesting thing, and this is something you'll see a lot in the course, is that the I and J components go to zero, but the K component remains. And so that's the only one that's there, and it's 45, and it's in the Z direction. Now, a useful sort of tip is that if you draw a circle like this with I, J, and K as shown, if you do J cross with uh, K, you'll get I. On the other hand, if you do K cross with J in the opposite sense, and in say the negative uh, alphabetical order, you get a negative I. And so that's kind of a useful rule to keep in your head as you're thinking about how these things work. Now, in this course, we tend to, we only focus on SI, but I, I tend to think that it's really useful to have something that uh, sort of says these are the other things that you got to worry about. And the other things you got to worry about are British gravitational and English engineering. Those are pretty commonly used. Uh, and the, the advantage, and I will admit that I will always get confused when I switch to British gravitational and English engineering, and in particular English engineering, because you have pound mass and pound force here, which kind of mess things up a bit in terms of solutions. But here you have SI, which is meters per second squared, kilogram, so it's an MLT system, and newtons, which is a derived quantity of force. Here uh, with British gravitational units, uh, you tend to have a force LT system, and mass is a derived unit. And the same thing here with mass and force. In terms so acceleration, mass, force, or weight, as we're going to go through it, depending on what we're dealing with. Then we have time, which is in seconds. And angular measurements, which are theta, which are always in radians. Um, but if you need to convert, you remember 180 radians is equal, or degrees is equal to pi radians. This is the course. So I put this in because I think you should see them. I think you should know about them. And 
usually I kind of recommend that you uh, be very, very careful when you're doing British gravitational or English engineering units to make sure that you remain uh, consistent with your units. And unit consistency has always been uh, a challenge for everybody, uh, especially when you are not careful writing your solutions. And this sort of leads into the last point. And the last point is that uh, unit consistency is something that when you're dealing with very, very talented people, say, for example, at NASA, they launched uh, something called the Mars Climate Observer uh, in 1998. It approached Mars in September 1999, before many of you were born. Um, and NASA lost contact with the craft almost immediately. And of course, you can imagine a lot of people back here were sort of saying, well, the little green men had finally blown up one of our probes. And what really happened was that there had been two engineering teams working with different units, SI and uh, British Gravitational. And so when they translated everything, they forgot to sort of make sure that they were using meters and feet consistently and to properly communicate. And that was a high cost for not using consistent units. Um, one thing I do recommend, and I thought I'd not removed it so quickly, was a tool called uh, MathCAD, uh, which you can get a copy, for, or MathCAD, which is free, and SMath Desktop. And later in the lecture series, you'll see a couple examples where I use both of those uh, software tools as a way of solving problems. And I strongly recommend, as you're doing homework, it's helpful to have some sort of computer algebra software package that you work from. So in terms of fundamentals of what we're talking about today, I'm just trying to define uh, particles and rigid body, go through a very quick uh, discussions on cross and vector products and, and basically vector properties. A uh, little bit on dimensions, just to introduce it because it's important and it's something that you're going to use a lot. And finally, dimensional consistency, which is honestly one of the biggest problems you face as you write exams uh, in the course. Dimensional consistency is something that uh, if you don't write down what your dimensions are, often you forget what they are, especially in a panic situation like an exam. So be very careful with that.